Thank you for the presentation and thank you for the invitation to the organizers. Um, before I come uh, to the content of my paper, a few words about my terminology. Uh, the title of the paper is The Nazi Camp Archipelago, Trajectories, Oral History and Network Analysis. I prefer the term archipelago to the term concentration camp or camp universe, which we heard several times uh, the last days here at the conference. Um, going back, universe, the term universe going back to David Rousset's book of 1946, L'Univers Concentrationnaire. In contrast to the notion of universe, uh, the notion of archipelago has several advantages. I have borrowed that term from Alexander Solzhenitsyn's work on the Soviet Gulag, um, the Gulag archipelago, and Solzhenitsyn is stressing the connections between uh, the islands, to take this metaphor of archipelago, the islands within this archipelagos, and in his words, the ships traveling between these islands. So he's focusing on the connections between these different uh, islands, uh, places uh, on this sea. And uh, he is focusing specifically on the movement of prisoners within uh, the Soviet camp system and uh, saying that these prisoners were in constant movement. Solzhenitsyn is, um, in his work, uh, focusing on the movement from the points of arrest into the camps in the far north or the far east. Whereas I'm using his terminology, but I'm focusing much more on the movements within the camp system. So, um, research on the Nazi camp system in the last 15, 20 years has provided us with detailed information about uh, the uh, many camps that existed uh, between 1933 and 1945. We have had many examples on such camps in the last days here. Um, research projects like uh, the Place of Terror, a nine-volume book series published in Germany in the last 10 years, the USH Encyclopedia of Camps and Ghettos still going on, but already three uh, volumes published, uh, memorial books, mapping projects, uh, like in Italy, I Campi Fascisti, which is a very interesting project, I think, or Holocaust memorials, have delivered us with detailed information about even the tiniest and short-living camps. Uh, those were forgotten until recently. The Yellow Warehouse is a very interesting example for that. Um, in Nazi-occupied Europe and Northern Africa, as well as those of collaborating countries. So the Nazi camp archipelago includes also those camps of the uh, collaborating countries. On the other side, um, survivors have published their memoirs about their experience immediately after liberation, 1944, 1945 already, but it's specifically the memory boom of the 1990s has led to the publication of thousands of survivors' memoirs. This was the last wave of um, the peak of Holocaust memory, I would say. And at the same time, in the 1980s and 1990s, huge oral history projects collected 10,000s of interviews with survivors. The largest one, Spielberg, Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation, uh, with uh, holding about 52,000 interviews, most of them Jewish survivors. So these accounts enabled researchers to analyze the subjective experiences of those who were persecuted, deported, and interned in the Nazi camp system. However, um, structurally oriented historians on the one side and oral historians on the other side, oral historians interested more in the history of experience, the subjective history of survivors, seem to be opposing poles in research on the Nazi camp system. In my presentation here, I will show that using formal methods of analysis of oral history interviews can provide us with a deeper understanding of the trajectories through the Nazi camp system going beyond the subjectivity of the interviews and beyond also uh, the histories of specific camps. It's in some way a uh, combination of a micro perspective with a macro perspective. My research is based on a collection of 860 interviews with survivors of the Mauthausen concentration camp. Um, these 
uh, interviews were collected in the years 2002, 2003. Um, in an initiative of the Austrian government that was the first uh, right-wing populist government uh, at that time in Austria. And uh, the interviews were collected, uh, that's an interesting point for the production, um, uh, sort of footnote here. Um, the interviews were collected in uh, almost all European countries, in North and South America and in Israel. They were produced in 16 different languages and they are now held in the archives of Mauthausen Memorial in Vienna. The, the information given by the, in these interviews uh, provides us to trace the way stations, the trajectories of their deportation all over Nazi-ruled Europe. A um, few more words about this uh, collection. Um, the so-called Mauthausen Survivors Documentation Project is by far the largest oral history project uh, done by one, on one single concentration camp. It, uh, this collection is in some way really unique. It was started at a very late uh, time uh, point, 2002, 2003, where very few survivors were still alive of the 190,000 persons deported to Mauthausen. About 100,000 survived. And in the year 2000, it is estimated, was estimated that about 10,000 were still alive, spread all over the world. And of these 10,860 were interviewed. Um, the interviews, uh, or the, uh, the interviews should in uh, the best way reflect the inmate society of Mauthausen concentration camp, mainly in national terms. So it, uh, the interviews are indeed in some way uh, reflecting proportionally um, the national groups uh, or ethnic groups uh, of uh, the inmate population of Mauthausen. Um, okay. um, I'll come back to that later, sorry. You have here uh, a table showing the countries of origin of the interviewees of the Mauthausen Survivors Documentation Project, so the countries uh, they were born in uh, the pre-war borders, and you see clearly the largest groups were from Poland and the Soviet Union, uh, Hungary, um, and many, many other different countries. Um, and a second table uh, is then showing the last place of internment before arriving in Mauthausen. So the only uh, point that uh, in some way connects all these different uh, life stories of 860 survivors um, is that they have spent uh, some time, not always the same time, in the Mauthausen concentration camp system. Some have been there just for a few days, uh, people arriving in the very last days of April, before liberation in April 1945, for example, some have spent five years uh, in the Mauthausen camp system, in different camps. So, my research is focusing, oh, sorry. My research is focusing on the different trajectories of different groups of uh, prisoners for example, Jewish versus non-Jewish prisoners, prisoners from different countries of origin. A close analysis of the trajectories will show that in different parts of German-occupied Europe, different types of internment were used for specific types of prisoners. Um, I just have to add that the 860 survivors of this uh, MSTP collection um, we're mentioning 6,000 different places of internment where they had been arrested. 6,000 different places all over Europe from uh, the Soviet Union to France, from uh, Greece to uh, Northern Europe. Um, the many transports from one camp to another experienced by these survivors uh, give us the possibility beyond the individual trajectories to analyze the specific role and function certain types of camps had in the German occupation and persecution policies during World War II. Um, one technology, one method used in the recent years to analyze these trajectories is GIS technology. 
But besides GIS technology, historical network research is, I think, a more powerful tool for the analysis of these trajectories and interdependence, uh, interdependencies within the Nazi camp system. Historical network analysis is essentially based on a method which allows to examine the relationship or non-relationship between individual actors or groups of actors to calculate mathematically their positions or their embedding within the whole group. And actors can be individual persons, groups, organizations, or camps in my case. Combining historical network research with oral history sources enables us to go beyond sources produced by the Nazi regime and to fill the gaps in these sources um, through uh, gaps mainly through the systematic destruction by the SS before the liberation of camps, the lack of uh, such sources. We heard the presentation uh, on the Hungarian camps, uh, Monor and Buda Kalash, where for one case there are no uh, sources except the uh, testimonies of survivors. Um, the life story interviews of survivors are indeed in most cases the only source to trace the roots of deportation. However, we have uh, also to include that the memory of survivors is influenced by the time span, almost 70 years, 60, 70 years after persecution, between the event and the autobiographical report, and also the effects of trauma and forgetting. Some survivors remember exact dates of arrest, deportation, or transfers to other camps. Others do not, did not even uh, remember uh, the names of places they had been, not knowing the language of the country they had deported to, for example, not knowing where they had been brought to, or just uh, don't, don't really remember exactly which year they had been deported. So um, one of the tasks was to cross-check um, the data given by survivors with uh, data produced by the persecutioners by the SS, but also all the other organizations uh, of the Nazi regime, which were uh, available in the Mauthausen archives, but especially in the International Tracing Service, holding the largest collection on uh, people deported by the Nazis uh, on about 13 million people. And the ITS opened at the beginning of our research project uh, shortly before in 2007. So counter-checking narrations of survivors with documents produced by the camp and administrations and others was indispensable. Um, however, such checks also proved some of the most unbelievable stories of survivors. For example, one story of a Soviet prisoner of war who was captured on the Crimean Peninsula and uh, was transported via the Ukraine, via Poland, Romania to Austrian territory and ended in the Mauthausen camp. He fled four times during these transports, four times recaptured, and indeed we could find a document proving that he was in a prison of war camp in southern Romania. Um, the, check, the trajectories of survivors from the MSDP sample followed different routes, depending first and foremost on the reason of arrest. I have a first graph. So that's network research. Um, that's what you get at the first um, when you have 860 people in all the different places they had been. Um, but my first example is on uh, the Greek sample. People uh, of Greek origin deported to Mauthausen. The graph shows the roots of survivors deported from Greece into the Nazi camp system. The network is making very clear, the graph is making very clear that there are two different, two main routes, the left and the right side. Um, these different, two different paths are uh, showing the difference between the deportation of Jews from Greece and of so-called political prisoners from uh, Greece. You have on this side here the political prisoners, all of them were arrested on the island of Crete, which is a problem of the sample. Um, the interviews were done only in that area of Greece. And they were trans collected all in a prison on Crete, in the Agia prison in the city of Kania, transported to Athens, uh, where they were held in the Averov prison, uh, transported further on. Uh, to, to Serbia, where uh, they had a stay in the Banitsa camp, 
And from there, they were transported directly to the Mauthausen concentration camp. Um, for the Jewish deportees from uh, Greece, the path, the trajectory was a very different one. And uh, we have also here to differentiate between um, the territories uh, occupied by the Germans and the territories occupied by the Italians in Greece. Um, you have, sorry, uh, where are we here? Um, from the Jews from Saloniki, the largest community, uh, Jewish community in Greece, but they're deported directly from the ghetto installed in Saloniki to Auschwitz. Five minutes, okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, whereas Jews in, in the Italian territory, that's here, look, uh, deported a year later on a different pathway through uh, a collecting point in Kaidari to Auschwitz. And from Auschwitz, uh, they were further on transported, mainly in January 1945, uh, to Mauthausen. My second example um, is a little bit more complicated. It's um, showing, this graph is showing the deportation of all Jews in Mauthausen. That's about 250 um, people, 250 survivors, and the graph shows the different uh, procedures of the deportation of Jews in different parts of Nazi-occupied <laughs> Europe. You have here, for example, the Hungarian Jews. Most of them were either directly deported, to, uh, were uh, collected in ghettos, deported to Auschwitz. Others were, uh, came, uh, were used as forced laborers and came via uh, the so-called Southeast fortifications, forced labor camps on the Austro-Hungarian border to Mauthausen. And on the other side, you have here the Polish uh, Jews who uh, spent uh, a long time in different forced labor camps before they tra were transported on to Mauthausen. So, um, to shorten this, uh, that's the Italian sample, and the Italian sample uh, you have here in the center Mauthausen concentration camp, and you see the uh, most important collecting points for um, these. Uh, survivors from Italy. Um, that's the San Vittorio prison in Milan. Um, the transit camp in Bolzano, uh, but also Fossili, and um, the camp in uh, Innsbruck. So okay. we, see, uh, we see that on the way uh, to Mauthausen, we have some junctions. Uh, for the Jewish survivors, the most important junction is Auschwitz. Uh, and second one, the Prashov camp near Krakow. These two camps have the highest centrality, one of the values you can calculate among the more than 400 different uh, internment centers. And uh, if we cluster some uh, places together, as uh, going back here, uh, these are clusters, so the forced labor camps and on the southeast wall and Austro-Hungarian border is a cluster of about 30, 40 different camps. Um, the network map shows clearly the complex structure of the deportation routes from the beginning to the last camp. It is striking um, that the deportation of the Western and Southeastern European Jews, as well as the Czech Jews, included far less uh, way stations than those of the Polish, Hungarian, or Slovakian deportees. Um, so about a quarter of Hungarian survivors were in the ghetto, 22% in forced labor camps, another 22% in camps on the Austro-Hungarian border. Um, nearly 12% went through transit or collecting camps on Hungarian uh, territory. Uh, being in a ghetto was followed in most cases by deportation to Auschwitz, where those who were summoned to the Hungarian labor service, uh, came, most of them came to the southeast wall fortifications and from there to Mauthausen. The situation is similar for the interviews born in pre war Poland. 20% of them report that they were in a ghetto, whereas ghetto uh, in rural Hungary was very different to ghettos in Poland. Um, a ghetto in the general government or in the Reichsgau Vaterland, 16% in forced labor camps. Only a small part was deported to Auschwitz. A central place of deportation was the Płaszow concentration camp in Krakow. The uh, trajectory of these, the two largest groups of Jews in my sample clo shows clearly 
that the classical deportation into a concentration camp or extermination camp, extermination camps are missing, as we don't have, of course, those who were killed immediately there. Uh, deportation was carried out in all cases only after a series of previous transport into the camps, forced labor camps, uh, ghettos, or transit camps. So to conclude, and I go back, I uh, didn't reorder it, um, our uh, imagination of deportation is shaped uh, to a large extent by representations of deportation like uh, the famous book of Caucus and Brun, Le Grand Voyage, The Grand Voyage, The Deportation Out of the Country. Um, and uh, the quote here uh, is showing the importance of this uh, deportation for St. Prune. It is uh, to leave um, the world of the living um, and to enter uh, uh, the reign of death. Um, the network analysis of the different uh, camps, ghettos, uh, different types of camps, where uh, these Mauthausen cells have been, show they had accumulated a lot of experiences before arriving in a concentration camp like Auschwitz or Mauthausen. Um, in the Italian case, to give you one or two examples, for, um, survivors are saying, for example, that the period in the San Vittorio prison was extremely hard. They were isolated there, they were tortured. When they arrived in the Fossili camp, one survivor is saying he was reborn in Fossili. We have similar accounts for the Compiègne camp, which was the main transit camp for the political deportees in France. They could walk in the camp premises, they could meet other people, they could talk with other people, they met, uh, they, they could make connections, which uh, in the case that were deported together, uh, were hold even then in, uh, when they arrived in Mauthausen, for example. So, uh, I think I'm out of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> so, um, what my point is, is that the deportation was less than a grand voyage, than a sort of a trajectory or parkour, uh, parkourso, uh, through the camps of National Socialist Europe, and the combination of macro and micro perspective allows us to uh, analyze uh, this parkour more deeply than from just researching the camps or the experiences of survivors. Thank you very much.